A very good morning to one and all, and welcome to the International Conference on Post-Pandemic Reforms in Medical ed Education for Accessible and Affordable Rural Healthcare. This morning, session one will focus on the affordability of medical education. The idea is to develop practical approaches for making medical education and training affordable, equitable, and inclusive for all qualified students who aspire for a medical career to inspire them to provide free or affordable healthcare to underserved and unserved communities. The co-chairs for this session are Dr. Raghupati, Senior Pathologist and Director, Medical Education, Sri Satisai University for Human Excellence. And Dr. Kulbushan Bali, Senior ENT and Maxillofacial Surgeon, Sri Satisai Sarla Memorial Hospital. We now request the session co-chairs to commence the discussion. Over to you, sir. Good morning. Our first speaker is Dr. Satish Babu, who is head of the Department of Endocrinology, Sparsh Hospitals, Bangalore. He shall speak on the topic, current policies and infrastructure required for medical college accreditation. A need, is, a need to re-examine. Over to Satish Babu. Thank you, Dr. Raghupati. Thank you, chairpersons. Thank you, co-panelists. Uh, good morning to all of you, Sairam. Offering my gratitude to Sadhguru, the founder of uh, Sri Satyasai University for Human Excellence, and thank you, Satyasai University, University for uh, Human Excellence, for inviting me to talk on this topic. I thank uh, Sunny Anandji for uh, uh, taking all the efforts in uh, conducting this uh, wonderful conference, and all the backstage people who have toiled for last uh, one month to, to get this going. And uh, uh, I was entrusted on this to be an open batsman, uh, even though it was not, uh, it's not my domain, but uh, I take this uh, opportunity as a Sadhguru sent uh, uh, opportunity to understand more about uh, education, medical education, and uh, which probably will help in the mission as well. So, with uh, so the topic I was I am given is as you can see current policies and infrastructure required for medical college accreditation. A need to re-examine the whole foundational objective of medical education is to, as you all know health for all, and, and health is a state of uh, complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It's not just absence of disease, and this is WHO declaration, WHO statement, WHO uh, objective, which all the healthcare professionals all over the, all over the globe who need to strive to achieve this goal for uh, the public, for the communities, for the population. Of course, our own, our own good old uh, Ayurveda also tells that the, that the harmony in body, mind, and soul is what is good health, and that, that again is the, is the objective of the medical education and healthcare services, healthcare delivery. So, so what is very important is without distinction, and uh, that's the key, and that's the whole theme about this medical education, without distinction, and uh, making this accessible, affordable. Are we, even in spite of all this modern advancement in, in almost all the spheres of life, life of a human being, are we addressing in, in a true sense is the question, is the pond, is what we should all ponder. And I will discuss on these three headings, current health situation in India. We have a gap, if we have a very uh, heterogeneous disease profile in India. We have communicable diseases like infections still very high in prevalence and non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia and ischemic heart disease, which are killers 
premature killers, I will say. People are dying at end with these problems. So, so that's one side, uh, whereas the other side is mother and child uh, health. Mother and child health, if you understand, it's not a disease, it's a propagation of life. Even that care, even the growth and nutrition, even that aspect is very bismal in India, and uh, that's the, the dismal in India, and that's, uh, that's uh, the figure statistics are very poor. So, so uh, uh, what is uh, the public uh, uh, sector doing? They're doing their best, and uh, Fortunately, the GDP for uh, uh, investment for uh, healthcare is progressively increasing, but it's still below the world average. We spend less than 2% of our GDP, whereas world average is 6%. And, and all this puts a lot of burden on the individuals, on the families to seek private healthcare, and that puts uh, uh, our uh, low and middle class and poorer uh, uh, individual families into a lot of financial burden. And you can see this is the last bit, is the Niti Aayog chairman saying that one, uh, uh, every one hour, 7,000 families or 7,000 individuals are being pushed to poverty. Most of, the, most of the government schemes are to elevate poverty. And here is the, here is a, uh, which is a, which is a, basic need and that need not being met, pushing the uh, people, communities into poverty. And, and there is a, as we discussed, heterogeneous and uh, very wide distribution of disease profile in India. Western countries, Western world has already conquered, but for uh, COVID infectious diseases, it's only non-communicable diseases which is more prevalent in Western India. But for in, in India, as I said, it's a double burden. Both communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases like diabetes are very high in prevalence and they are the leading causes of death. And rural healthcare, you all have seen multiple videos, multiple presents, uh, presentations, and uh, it's, uh, it's a crisis. And this crisis was made worse by COVID. Uh, uh, you can see the, uh, these are all uh, almost regular headlines and, uh, the, uh, and one of the morning speakers was saying uh, to be sensitive and very sadly, very sadly the sensitivity yard has uh, become, is becoming blunt in uh, doctors and the public and, and nothing has been done for last 75 years to address these issues which are, which are addressable. Uh, and, COVID, as I said, has opened up a wide gap in this healthcare delivery. Uh, and the, uh, again, the di disparity between uh, uh, rural and uh, urban has been talked. You have PHCs and district health hospitals understaffed. District health hos hospitals are secondary, uh, uh, secondary care centers, referral centers. Even there, there are uh, uh, specialists being uh, uh, only 30 percent, 20 percent in many of the hospitals. Primary health care center also you can, uh, you can see across the states there are only 30 to 40 percent uh, recruited and, and that's putting a lot of pressure on, uh, uh, on uh, rural health care system, making uh, the rural population to seek the private uh, health care and that putting the financial burden and over a time in last, especially in last 30, 40 years, the healthcare services and medical education in India is becoming very commercialized. That's the direction it's, it's going, unfortunately. And, and this, this study in, uh, in UK, NHS is a, in, if you take any country in the world, NHS, National Health Services, is a best example for public health service. And in that country, this study on July 4th, it came out in Lancet. If you see the title itself is for health, for profit healthcare might be damaging po uh, population. And, and if, you, if you read the one percent, uh, one percentage point increase in annual procurement from private for profit sector, was associated with sub, uh, subsequent 0.38% uh, treatable mortality. 
So increase in treatable mortality. So this is, this is glaring and this is uh, shocking as well. So, so you can see where the, where the soul of healthcare leading to, unfortunately, from being a service driven to a commodity driven where for profits are more important than the life. So coming back, so if, you, if we talk about infrastructure requirement for medical education, NMC has a strict guidelines and these are the departments which have to be up and running. And, and, there, the, and over time, if you ask me in modern medicine, the departments are adding 30, 40 years back, you had uh, uh, less of uh, radio diagnosis. Now it, it's a big department, you have radiotherapy and probably as we go, There'll be, there'll be departments like genetics, there'll be department of IT, art, artificial intelligence as well. So, so this is where the policy makers have to start being progressive and think through. Uh, NMC requirement for 100 medical seats, a prerequisite is 360 bedded hospital running for at least two years with 60% bed occupancy and 400 outpatients. There's, there is the strict guidelines for uh, uh, star, that uh, for professors and assistant professors lecture uh, posts. The, the building norms are very very regulated. Uh, all this are very critical, and because you are dealing with disease and critical patients, you are dealing with the life. So I don't think there is a, a compromise on this. Of course, there are other accommodation requirement, hostel requirement, because most of the times the doctors have to stay nearby, and, and you have OTs. So, so this is about infrastructure. Does infrastructure build uh, institutes and the nation? No. It's individuals which, which, uh, which make the institutions which go on to make a nation building. And uh, you can read the famous uh, statement from Einstein. You give the atmosphere and they blow them. And, and they blow them with knowledge and wisdom. And, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Nitin Gankane and Dr. Manjnath today who, who have built such institutes uh, 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 and, and uh, uh, pro uh, uh, propagated uh, medical knowledge and wisdom. So coming to medical education policy aspect, what are the challenges? See, uh, the first three topic, first three uh, points I will ignore. You need a very good uh, doctor, doc, uh, very good doctor who is a teacher, doctor per se, Latin word means to teach, who is a role model. We had professors who are, who are role models. Uh, so student selection policies are questionable. As, as we all know, there is no basis to test their uh, human, human abilities, aptitude test. Medical education curriculum is again not uh, uh, sensitive to the requirement or the national uh, community needs, uh, we, because uh, what is the what is the what is the conclude what how do I conclude because the because the uh, uh, mortality figures morbidity figures which we all see are still nowhere near nowhere near uh, what the lowest should be. So so the so the doctor training doctor curriculum has to be sensitive to the to the community disease profile, to the prevention of disease pro process. Medical education is not inclusive. We talk about uh, being inclusive in other spheres, but medical ed education is not inclusive for the recent advances. And, and can we think out of box and make it more affordable using technology, using IT, is what we need to see rapid and un uh, uneven growth, which we talked, if, uh, Dr. Manjunath mentioned, that South India has better medical education uh, profile, whether, whereas North Northeast has less. And unfortunately, these uh, medical colleges, more than 50 percent, more than 60 percent, uh, especially recent ones, are all private, and, and obviously they cut corners and make profit as a as a pr process. And the service motto: Is it in-driven in these private institutes? is a questionable thing. Commercialization of medical education, and uh, unfortunately, that drive has taken the government also as a backseat and uh, made government education. I studied on a subsidized fees, whereas now uh, the fees are, uh, are uh, very high for a even middle class person where, uh, in government school, medical school itself, leave alone poor, 
a poor, poor uh, uh, student uh, pursuing or dreaming about medical education. They are prohibitive fees. Uh, so changing trends on medical education to explore affordability, this uh, classroom and bedside teaching has moved to student and simulation-based. Research and innovation are uh, key to medical education. IT-enabled e-learning, open learning, uh, medical informatics, all this are, are uh, one-time investments probably. Augmented reality, artificial intelligence, all this will, will make uh, uh, the medical education exciting and healthcare delivery exciting, so we should uh, see how it can easily blend to make it affordable. The traditional learning method, hospital intense. We, we were all made to uh, learn in the hospital, less in community. Uh, it was patient-centered, illness-related, more of episodic, uh, incident-driven, reactive care, means there is, a, there is an emergency, you react to that. There is an infection, you react to this mostly generalized, but it should move to community-based, prevent you, uh, population-based, holistic wellness promotion uh, related uh, uh, medical education is what the world needs, what the population needs. It should be a preventive, not reactive. Prolonged with wearable devices, you can, you can continuously monitor rather than being reactive, uh, uh, precise, individualized, because each individual is different, each individual, again, if you go to Ayurveda, each individual soul, mind, and bodies are different, their thought process is different, so, so the genetic make is different, uh, race is different, all that makes you to individualize the treatment, and this should be the uh, continuous way to Im uh, incorporate in our medical education. Coming to med medical education in India, on the uh, financial aspect, as I said, it's very competitive and become a course-driven. NEET is a course-driven, now urban-driven uh, 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 process. So making the rural children, poorer children disadvantaged or putting them on, onto a higher financial burden, leading to loans, leading to mortgage, and obviously with that financial uh, uh, burden on their shoulders, they will start looking for a lucrative money-making as a career, uh, not as a service as a career. And, and uh, to continue, uh, annual per capita income for, of India is 1,900, whereas the fees starts for, from $1,000 per annually in a government medical school. Uh, it goes up to almost 600, 700 times in, uh, in uh, uh, private institute. So 18 lakh children write NEET exam, there are only 80,000. That mismatch puts a lot of students to see for other, uh, other cheaper options, including uh, what we all know you, what happened with Ukraine war. And, and uh, uh, unfortunately, these children don't come back to serve in the rural uh, areas where, where the two-thirds of population lives. And, and uh, uh, huge, debt make, huge debt make them uh, uh, look for lucrative jobs and uh, their career is driven on commerce rather than care. So postgraduate, when, when, talk, when talking about postgraduation and super specialty training, we, we are still in a low numbers in uh, postgraduate training and that is being reviewed. Post MBBS, nowhere in the world, as I know, after MBBS, a student or a, a doctor sits at home and reads for NEET or reads for NEET postgraduate exam. It, you're, you're already a, a productive individual. You have to be productive, and that's how you get hands-on experience. You should keep work, working and study. So that concept has to be drilled in policymakers and make our uh, uh, MBBS qualified doctors to work and study rather than sit at home and study or go to course and study. So a lot of district hospitals, we saw government district hospital staff are only 30, 40 percent and this is, this is a uh, this is a group or this is the uh, around 10,000 to 20, uh, 15,000 graduates come out every year. They, they can be posted and some incentive can be given for need postgraduate uh, uh, seat uh, allotment. So, so what is the effective answer? Having been here, you all know effective answer is subsidi subsidized, free healthcare and medical education. That's the eternal and that's the long-term answer. 
you, you, you take the purity of purpose to the end result, uh, decommercializing the healthcare and medical education and integrity of an academic institute. When you, when you mix commerce, the ethics gets com compromised. Uh, so the core values are, uh, are uh, given lesser importance. So, so this is the answer for all the, all the difficulties, miseries, what I enumerated, what you all know in the field of health and uh, medical education. So you, you have one solution, one impactful solution for all the, all the issues, providing subsidized free medical education, equitable, which will reach to the rural and uh, lower strata as well, powered by, of course, empathy, human values, and ethics. So this will, uh, this will lead to a new breed of uh, healthcare professionals who, who, who put care and service in front of them and, and uh, other uh, worldly things behind them. Healthcare, and that will, that will definitely lead to healthcare for all. And with this vision from our founder, I want to conclude. And the, the lower part of the statement was only two, two days back, one uh, American uh, devotee asked Swami what you want to give as a message to American healthcare. And Swami said, becoming more selfless is the answer for the world's health and medical education problem. And, and I conclude with this slide. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a uh, history of medical education and the golden age of uh, uh, healthcare and medical education was during 800 BC when uh, uh, Sushruta and Charaka uh, propagated the Ayurveda. It's, uh, we, we have to reflect that uh, the time has come and thank you for your patience. Thank you. Questions will be taken at the end. Sorry, apologies. My son is writing neat exam. <laughs> I have to drop him to the exam center. Now I invite Dr. Sachidanan who is a former Vice Chancellor, Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Bangalore. He shall speak on the topic, public-private partnerships and resources sharing to reduce costs and improve the quality of medical education. Over to Dr. Sachidanan. Very good morning to one and all. Thank you, Chairperson, for that uh, nice introduction. My topic today is about public-private partnerships and resource sharing to reduce the cost and also to improve the quality of medical education. This is a very relevant and current topic for the fact that the very word that public-private partnership, is it an answer for all the problems that we have in medical education and also in health services, that topic itself is the answer. Yes, we have two hands. One hand is public, other hand is private. When these two hands come together, the uh, their clapping is possible. And of course, two hands are better than one in any uh, work that we take up. And that is what it means. Public-private partnerships are the future for all the problems that medical education and also health services, health care delivery system in India. I would just speak on this topic in, uh, in the following headings, definition, pros and cons, public uh, partnership in health care, challenges in medical education, PPP in medical education, and then summary and conclusion. How do we define public-private partnerships? In fact, there is no consensus about how to define a private public partnership. The term can cover hundreds of different types of long-term contracts with a wide range of risk allocations, funding arrangements, and transparency requirements. 
any venture where a public undertaking and a private undertaking come together is a public-private partnership. It could be in any field. It could be in infrastructure development. It could be in uh, you know healthcare delivery system, or it could be in any any sort of uh, public-private partnerships. And all this became necessary because government itself or the public enterprise itself could not deliver everything that the society needed. So they had to depend on a private organization to come forward and help them out. And that is how this new public management of the late 20th century, there is neoliberalism and globalization pressures led to public-private partnerships. It's also called as PPP or 3P or P3 in, in short. It's an arrangement between two or more public and private sectors on a long-term ba basis. Any, any venture, any partnerships, any contract between public and private is always welcome. Typically, it involves private capital financing the government projects and then providing the services. It has been already implemented in multiple countries. It is not a new thing. We are not talking about public-private partnership as a new venture. It's already there. It's, it's been implemented in multiple countries. Of course, it was more most in the infrastructure projects, uh, like building schools, equipping and operating uh, hospitals, transport systems, water and sewerage uh, systems, sanitation, etc. Now, today, we are now concerned about how we can bring this public-private partnership in healthcare delivery system and also in medical education. When we talk about PPP, there are always some concerns. And one of the major concerns that we are looking at is that PPP continues to be highly controversial as a funding tool, largely over concerns that public return on investment is lower than the returns of the, for the private funder. The person who ventures, a private funder, uh, wants to start up a PPP, is always concerned about re returns. Why does he invest if he doesn't get back money for what, whatever he's investing? PPP are closely related to concepts such as privatization. The general concept is that if we hand over a particular se segment of service, like medical education, to private agency, we are privatizing it. And that will take away so many benefits for the poor and the com common man. So that is another concern. And the lack of shared understanding of what a PPP should be, unless you put a system in place, unless you put a template in place, the PPP model also will not succeed. So we need to sit and trash out the differences and then also have transparency built into it. Then uh, PPP can be a successful model. In fact, private-public partnership is one of a very important uh, subject learned by BBM and MBA students. They, they are taught about these things as to how to make these uh, successful. There are a lot of pros and cons for PPP. The benefits of a private-public partnership is they provide better infrastructure solutions than an initi initiative that is wholly public or wholly private, right? PPPs enable the public sector to harness the expertise and experience and efficiencies uh, available in the private sector. They result in faster project execution. I'm, I'm not trying to demean the public sector as such, but these are the advantages if a PPP can uh, work, be worked out. A return on investment can always be thought of risks are fully appraised early on to determine the project feasibility. Everything is thrashed out much earlier itself. The operational and project execution risks are transferred from the government to the private participant. A, a PPP allows government funds to be redirected to other important socio-economic areas. This is a very important point. Government can reserve its funds for better or, or other uh, projects rather than you know, uh, spend it on a project which private entity can take up and run the cost. So PPP that reduce costs potentially can lead to lower taxes because government needs money to run certain uh, you know, projects. If the projects are handed over to the private thing, government can reduce its uh, bur burden of collecting taxes. What are the disadvantages? PPP involves risk for the private participant who always reasonably expects some money to be compensated, one. Number two, when there are only a limited number of uh, private entities and if the project is very big, you don't get uh, good private agencies to come and fill up the gap. The, the competition becomes very less. Number of players will be, become very less. That's a hurdle we have. Profits of the projects can be vary depending on the risk involved 
the level of competition and things like that. So the person who wants to invest will think of all these things. What is more uh, important is PPP would privatize all the public services so the cost can go up. Secondly, profits private entities rather than the public. And thirdly, taxpayers are not benefited. Most of the taxpayers are very concerned about this. What are the ways in which we can, what are the models available, time-tested models available in private-public partnership is operate and maintenance contract, build and finance, build, operate and transfer, that is called BOT, build, own, operate and transfer, and there's so many such models. There is no one model which works out good in a particular thing. We need to time test it out and then uh, give the opportunity for the private agency to select what they want, and then the control should be kept by the government. Very recently, our uh, Honorable Prime Minister also mentioned about public-private partnership. He has also opined about this, and this is not new. As early as 2006, this is Dr. Anbumani Ramdas, who was the then uh, health minister, also talked about uh, PPP. That means we have been talking about PPP for quite some time now, and a few projects have been implemented in India, I'll come to that later on, and we are successful. So this is the way forward, and I don't know why still governments are thinking about it, especially in health sector. In Canada, for more than two decades, PPP has already been implemented. One third of all its PPP projects nationwide are on healthcare projects. So as a developed nation, we have a standing example already in Canada for having implemented PPP. And of course, uh, a PPP should be of a long-term duration. It cannot be a short term for three years or five years. 15 to 20 years or even 30 years is what uh, is necessary. And a private enterprise should be allowed to design, build, maintain, and or manage the delivery of agreed upon services over a term of contract. To the entire period of contract, the private agency should maintain all that. Finally, the private sector receives payment for its services, which may be, you know, talked out earlier itself. What are the challenges in medical education? This was very much highlighted by the speaker since the morning. Shortage of doctors. Just to give you an example, today, coincidentally, today NEET exam is happening all over the country. 18 to 20 lakh students are writing NEET exams today. This is one of the largest attended uh, entrance exam tests anywhere across the world. That means the demand to become doctors is very high in India. At the same time, on the other hand, we have also have a shortage of doctors. What are we offering them? Though we have 18 to 20 lakh students desiring to become doctors, ultimately worry only less than one lakh of them will succeed and become doctors. The number of seats in undergraduates, all 600 colleges put together is around one lakh. Of course, the government is thinking of increasing by increasing the number of medical colleges, but we have to look at the prospects of whether it's going to be viable, feasible, desirable to start more colleges. Uh, more so, the government, of course, is always thinks of the uh, tribal areas, the hilly areas, where uh, inaccessible areas, because uh, healthcare has to be accessible. So that is the policy of the government that it has to open one medical college, government medical college in each district. So that policy is fine. But ultimately, it may marginally increase the number of seats but still the aspirants are always there. And um, Dr. Manjana has also mentioned about the maldistribution of doctors. Doctors are concentrated in urban areas, are less in rural areas. Of course, there are many reasons for that. There is high demand for the UG medical seats, less number of postgraduate seats. Of the one lakh students who take up medical uh, subject, only about 40,000 students get to become postgraduates. And of course, in many of them are preclinical and paraclinical subjects, which are not even taken up every year. So ultimately, around 25 to 30,000 students pass out as postgraduates. What happens to the rest 70,000 students? Where are they going? Year after year, they get accumulated. Backlog is increasing. We don't know what, what to offer to them. So again, frustration sets in. So migration of students to foreign countries. We have been talking about Ukraine crisis made us realize that around 30,000 students from India have gone to Ukraine to study medicine. That is one country. We have students going to Russia, we have students going to China, 
Armenia, Georgia, Poland, and many other countries, and that itself is around more than 1 to 1.5 lakhs every year. That means 1 lakh students graduate in India, another 1.5 lakh students are graduating outside every year. And when they come back, another sad story is when they come back, they are not allowed to practice like immediately. They have to take a licentiate exam and then qualify to be practicing in India, and then only they are allowed to uh, register in the medical councils. So only the pass percentage of such students who come from foreign countries, who have had uh, education in foreign countries, the pass percentage is around 20%, very dismal. So again, there are a lot of students who are let, uh, left out, frustrated, and uh, this thing. So all this leads to the challenges in medical education. Higher cost of education, yeah, to some extent I agree, because government has also provided free seats, subsidized seats. A chunk of seats are all subsidized, but there are a lot of students for competing for that. Quality of medical education. There is a common dictum that if quantity improves, quality goes down. So if the number of colleges goes up, the quality of education comes down. So we need to keep a tab on the quality of medical education also. Updating the curriculum periodically. It took almost uh, two decades to update the curriculum in medical education. Very recently, we have changed our curriculum. We have made it uh, competency-based. It took about two decades for us to change that. And planning commission estimates shortage of 6 lakh doctors in India, 10 lakh nurses, and about 2 lakh dental doctors. This is still there. And of course, the starting of new colleges might address this issue. What did Niti Aayog do? Niti Aayog is the think tank, think tank of the government, where experts are brought in and then they are allowed to discuss on various issues. What did Niti Aayog do about medical education in India? It drafted a model agreement uh, uh, policy between private entities and government-run district hospitals to establish and maintain medical colleges. Niti Aayog has come out with this PPP model. It has propagated PPP model so that many uh, you know, colleges and hospitals can come up to look after the rural, rural health services. And it addressed two, it, it was discussing the whole thing on two matters. One is shortage of manpower. Second is unequal distribution of health professionals. These two things they wanted to address. So what did they do? What did they suggest? New or existing medical colleges to be linked with district hospitals. This is what they have propagated. Minimum annual intake of 150 undergraduate students to start postgraduate departments at the end of four or five years. Hospitals to be upgraded to 750 beds by private agencies, of which 300 beds are designated as free beds. Rest of the beds are called as market beds because they have to earn money out of that to run the show. Provision of admissions to all categories of students should be made and tuition fees to be fixed as per law. These are the recommendations of the Niti Ayo. What are the disadvantages? This recommendation, if we go by PPP model, it does not address the shortage of doctors or health professionals. Many a times you require more. It doesn't address unequal distribution of health professionals because these colleges, if they are not set up in rural areas, if they're not set up in hilly areas and tribal areas, it's not going to benefit anybody. And that's why this college, this has become a model college, Satya Sai College, because it's being set up in a rural area. And free patient beds are reduced. Earlier, the district hospital used to be 400 bedded uh, hospitals and all of them were free. Now by adding a medical college there, you're reducing the number of beds by another 100. You're making it 300 beds. So the public are concerned. They said why by free beds are being reduced. And always there will be a differential treatment for the person who pays and the person who doesn't pay. That differentiality should not be so visible. It should be blurred. We all know that medical colleges were being established by either central government or state government or universities had the privilege to start medical colleges. Some charitable societies and trusts were also uh, opening medical colleges. Now, PPP model is to open uh, medical colleges through private companies. What has NMC, National Medical Commission, done to uh, propagate or help uh, medical education in India? It has relaxed certain rules. The rules which MCI had was really uh, very tough to start a medical college and run and maintain it. Now, NMC has reduced or relaxed many things. One is it has allowed two campuses because in a city, you cannot get 25 acres of land in one place. So it has allowed two campuses where medical college is in one campus, the hospital is another campus. Land area relaxations have been done. 
It doesn't um, specifically mention you have 25 acres or 20 acres. It only says a medical college can be run in a place where there is required number of built-up area. You could have 5 lakh square build building, you can run a medical college. Whether it's vertical or horizontal or in 10 acres or 5 acres, doesn't matter. That is a big relaxation. It has reduced the student-faculty uh, ratio. That means number of faculties have been reduced. Relaxation in inspection criteria. It was very strict earlier. Now there are certain relaxations in inspection criteria. And of course, penalties levied are more in the monetary form. Earlier they used to cancel the admission for one whole year. How can a college sustain if admissions are not given in that particular year? Now they have made it more monetary. If you are not having uh, this number of facilities, you pay one crore penalty or two crore penalty. That would motivate the private agencies to maintain the standards that is required of them. The best example I can give of a PPP in India is in Gujarat. In 2009, Gujarat Adani Institute of Medical Sciences is the first public-private partnership endeavor between government of Gujarat and Adani Education and Research Foundation. This model was established in uh, a city called Buj in Kutch area. It's working out very well. It, everything has been worked out in a, in a nice fashion so that the government is not burdened. The, uh, there is a win-win situation. The government is not burdened. The public is getting free uh, treatment. And the private uh, organization, in a not low, loss or not, no profit basis, are running the show. This is what is a role model that we need to emulate everywhere. And uh, uh, we have a nice example with us here. And after that, Gujarat mentioned, uh, you know, brought in a lot of uh, uh, innovations. They brought two models. One is called a greenfield model. And second one is called a brownfield model. What is greenfield model? Where the government had to provide land on lease or 50% of the market value of the land was supposed to be given to the private agency. The agency who wanted to start a medical college had to construct a new hospital and college on their own. And government gave them 75 crore financial assistance to establish this college and also extended 30% concession for purchase of various medical devices so that the burden will come down. And beyond that, they were also giving concessions in electricity and water bills. So the, they made the colleges feasible. They made the colleges viable so that they can may give free treatment to many uh, public, you know. This is what the greenfield model. And what does the brownfield model uh, indicate? It permits usage of existing district hospital. There is already an hospital. The private agency need not build another hospital. It can only improvise that hospital to whatever requirements the NMC wants. And then permit to upgrade the existing hospital, 37.5, that is 50% of what they were giving in Greenfield, crores, was the financial assistance was given, concessions in utilities and like water and electricity, and what more, it extended all the government health benefit scheme, like Aishman Bharat, uh, or um, you know, Yashaswini and other schemes, whatever the local governments were running, they were also extended to these private agencies. So that, with these, I am told in Gujarat, around five brownfield model colleges, and about three greenfield model colleges are running. Back in 2020, I also organized one, uh, uh, you know, guidelines for establishing medical colleges through public-private partnership in 2020. I initiated this process so that Karnataka government also takes up this uh, issue. Our team went to Gujarat, found out all the, uh, how it was functioning, and then came and gave a presentation. Niti Ayog people were also there to emphasize the fact, and after this, we had our uh, uh, then medical education minister in attendance. Of course, he, uh, uh, he got changed, but then the model is still there. The Rana government is thinking. Very recently, as, early, as late as May 2022, uh, High Court of uh, Madras, Tamil Nadu, gave a uh, uh, verdict saying that PPP model is the one which has to be adopted. There was a dispute between one uh, private university Srinivasan University with uh, the government of Tamil Nadu. They wanted to be independent and want to start a medical college, but the DME didn't allow. He said, no, without your affiliation to the public uh, university, you cannot start a medical college. But then the uh, Tamil Nadu government, gave, I mean, High Court gave a judgment saying that, why don't you adopt a PPP model? All, all are going to benefit, uh, you know, it's a win-win situation. So in summary, PPP model of establishing new medical college is not new. We have several models before us. By and large, they have been successful. If they have any deficiencies, if there are any uh, lacunae, why don't we correct it and then improvise it? So 
State governments and union territories have to rethink about starting of new medical colleges. To give an example, in Karnataka, there are 31 districts. How many government medical colleges are there? 22. That means 9 or 10 districts still do not have medical colleges. If a government has to start a medical college, it has to spend 350 crores for one government medical college and then, of course, maintenance year after year, salary and other things, recurring expenditure. 10 medical colleges, 10 more medical colleges to be started goes to 3,500 crores government has to spend initially and then for maintenance, I think at least another 500 to 600 crores every year. A medical college becomes a white elephant for government because it is committed to give health medical education services and health services free of cost. So the best answer for this is why doesn't government adopt PPP model? Why shouldn't it take up? I'll come to that. There are several private players eager to take up running medical colleges, which doesn't mean that we give permission to everybody. We have to pick and choose. I'll give you an example. I was speaking to one very big business house. Their turnover, annual turnover is 70,000 crore per annum. For them, a, a business house having 70,000 crore business, per, per annum, spending 500 crores every year, is it a big amount? They did not make profit at all. They are not business minded also. What they want is a name. If such an uh, uh, you know, pub, uh, organization is running a free hospital, how much name it gets? The public will, the public uh, respect that they get is much more than what they invest. So why don't we tap such individuals? Why don't we ca catch hold of such business houses? People are there to ready to spend, but we are kept, we are kept ourselves aloof. Let the governments open up their eyes, catch hold of such things, let them see through, let them not give it to uh, all and sundry. There are people, genuine people still in the society, like Satyasa University, who are ready to take up this uh, provision of uh, running PPP models in rural areas. And government is collecting CSR funds, 2 to 3 percent from all these. Why don't we, for a 70,000 crore organization, 3 percent comes up to almost uh, 210 crores. So this my fund itself is enough to run a medical college. Give them permission, give them free land, give them uh, you know concession in our, They'll run the show in a big way. They'll do it in much better way than uh, you know others. So it's a win-win model which can be adopted by anybody. In conclusion, how do we reduce cost of establishing medical colleges? Provide land on lease. Provide utilization of existing district hospitals. There are district hospitals. No need to re uh, re reconstruct the thing. Only. We can improvise the district hospitals, subsidize electricity, water, and taxes. There are innumerable number of taxes on medical colleges, pollution control board, biomedical waste, STP, and so many of them. So you know we can relax a little bit for those at least. Fifty percent of seats to be subsidized should be given to government. Let government fill up that. Let the neat exam be conducted. Neat uh, passing candidates should be filled up in these fifty percent of seats. The other fifty percent also to be filled up by neat past candidates, but they should be regulated fees. I don't say, don't leave it to the private organization to fix up the fees. Regulate the fees. We should know how much fees would be sufficient to run the college. So this is the model. It's already there. It needs to be implemented. And regulate fees for post-graduation also. Now, radiology is uh, 2 crores and above. Dermatology is 2 crores. Orthopedic uh, surgery and OBG are 1.5 crores. Who can afford? Not many can afford. But it doesn't mean that uh, individuals should not aspire to become an orthopedician or a dermatologist or a radiologist. We should make provision for such things, so regulate the fees. Free beds and treatment for public should be ensured. Provide government health benefit schemes, which is a very wonderful thing. And financial accountability and should be always there. Government control should be there. Even in a PPP model, government should be supreme. Whatever government says should rule the roost. Private cannot wag their tail, just like that. So let governmental control should be there, then PPP model works wonderful. How do we improve medical education? CBME, why this was introduced? Competency-based medical education is the standard in the gold, gold standard globally, and that has been introduced for both UG and PG. PG is yet to happen, but UG is already implemented. Two batches have already written exams. Of course, COVID also had some uh, problems, uh, uh, created some problems, but that has been overcome to start a new relevant courses and departments. We should march with the time. 
emergency department is a compulsory department. Family physician department is a compulsory department. Geriatric department should be started. These are all relevant new things that has to be thought of. Uh, and then, you know, courses should be started like this. Most importantly, to train and refresh faculty periodically. We appoint an assistant professor at the age of around uh, 30 until he retires till 60 or 70 for 40 years, no training. He keeps on uh, telling whatever he knows, doesn't improve, doesn't upgrade, doesn't uh, update. That should not happen. Faculty training should be done periodically. Faculty appraisal should be done. He should also know how a faculty is performing and then that feedback should be taken. To build a strong research environment, of course, medical colleges and district hospitals, the clinical material available, such a treasure. We should not waste this treasure, go, go into the drains. That should be utilized for research, both epidemiological research, basic research, clinical research, and also collaborative research. That will give you a lot of data, and the policy makers can utilize that data to uh, build more uh, robust uh, healthcare system. To foster interdepartmental and interdisciplinary collaborations. That's very important within the campus. And also to establish MOUs with reputed centers of excellence. There are a lot of ex uh, excellent centers, uh, and that could be, MOUs could be established. Thank you so much for this. I conclude by saying that <laughs> public-private partnership is a beautiful concept. The 3P or P3 should be adopted. Government should open up their eyes at this point of time. Not only medical colleges, but nursing colleges. Taluka, health, uh, taluka hospitals with 100 beds, can be given to nursing colleges. This 100 beds hospital can be given for training allied health science students. We are all wasting our resources. The resources are there, but we are not putting them to good use. PPP model is a very good thing. I conclude by saying that we should uh, encourage this in the, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Satyanan. The next speaker is Nitin Gangane. Director, Professor and Dean, Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Sevagram. He shall speak on the how the magic of free or low-cost medical education can alter the values, lifestyle choices, practice settings, and health care provided by inspired medical graduates. Over to Nitin. Thank you, sir. A very good morning. As you can see that my topic is a quite long, quite big. So what I have done is I have underlined certain things and I will be only focusing on that. That is the free and low cost medical education, whether it can alter the healthcare provided. And I will be briefly talking about values uh, which I personally saw changed in certain students. Uh, I will be briefly talking about that experiment also. Uh, so, since morning we have been discussing about inequities in the rural health. It was the International Inter Labor Organization who released a report in 2015. In that report, they mentioned that 56% of rural residents worldwide are without any legal health coverage. So, they do not have legislation or affiliation with the health insurance peak as compared to 22% of the urban population. About 83% of Africa's rural population have no entitlements to health care. So they do not have any access to health care. So globally, most deprived health coverage is in the rural population or in Africa. The report also highlighted about the rural-urban differences. We have going, been talking since morning. They occur not only in health staffing, but even financing of the services, the money which is provided for rural health is much less than what is provided for the urban health. And also the legal coverage in legal rural population is much low as compared to urban population. The health worker shortages is extreme in the rural areas and globally it is estimated that 7 million health workers are lacking in rural areas as compared to 3 million in urban areas. Uh, you must understand that only uh, health facility is not the only factor which affects rural health. R rural health care issues are also aggravated by out-of-pocket expenditure. They are 
ignorant of government services which are available. There is underutilization or wastage of health resources. The organizational support is poor and there is virtually no existent, uh, non-existent professional networking. And in addition, there is a lack of infrastructure, which is uh, not matching with the demands of rising population. So what is the situation in India? India, you know, that is the largest democratic republic in the world and supports almost 16% of the world population. According to 2011 census, 68% population resides in rural area. And out of these 68% population, 86% of the medical visits from the rural area with majority still travel for more than 100 kilometers to avail healthcare facility. And out of that, 70 to 80% poor patients bear the expenditure out of pocket, landing them in poverty. So this out of extra pocket expenditure for rural health is one of the main areas uh, which we have to focus on. Out of the total 640 districts, almost 75% are rural districts, whereas if you see the number of colleges, only 27% colleges are present in rural areas. The one positive move uh, which was done in by the National Medical Council bill in 2016 is that the criteria for establishment of new medical college are relaxed for under served areas. So what is the present situation of medical education in India? You must understand that medical schools don't only provide medical education. Medical schools also provide population living in its vicinity to a greater access to physicians and specialized care beyond levels that might be routinely available in the health system. They also generate employment opportunities for the local population. So medical schools have ability to influence local healthcare system as well as health of the local population. India has the highest number of medical colleges followed by Brazil and China in uh, throughout the world. But these medical students who are passing out from our medical colleges do have a limited exposure to the needs of rural healthcare and how to address them. And rural healthcare is equated with a poor quality healthcare. So if a medical student and young doctors has to understand the reality, they must be trained how rural centered healthcare can be provided and what are the challenges they are going to face if they are going to work in rural areas. So trained health workers in rural location is likely to enhance recruitment and retention of skilled healthcare providers in rural areas and possibly help in limiting the role of quacks in the healthcare delivery system. At present, most of the MBBS graduates from rural areas who pass out are unlikely to serve in their own rural area after graduation. This is a fact. So there was a proposal that 50% reservation should be uh, in the postgraduate courses should be from students who have done the rural uh, service for three years. And also it was proposed that such applicants would be required to serve another three years in remote, remote areas after acquiring the PG degree. But we must understand that just uh, sending them to rural areas is not going to solve the problems unless and until you take care of other problems. Uh, there was also mentioned that quota can be started to get admission to MBBS course for candidates who belong to rural community and ensure that they will return with bond to serve in rural and remote areas. So what are the, how to focus on rural health workforce? The location of medical college in rural district with public ownership is among the variables which have been strongly associated with tendency to produce rural graduates. These are the studies which have been actually done and they have found that the rural medical schools play an important role in overcoming the shortage of physicians in the rural communities. It was also shown that medical school in the rural areas the 97 percent of the graduates from the these uh, medical school in rural areas were employed in the rural district where they were trained so if you are having a rural institution it is most likely that the students will stay back in that area and will continue to offer their services 
It was also found that 40% of graduates from medical schools in urban areas were employed in the district where they are trained. Out of that, 23% work in rural areas. So you can see the difference. Uh, if you have instituted in rural area, 97.7% will stay there. And if you are instituted in the urban area, only 23.7% will continue to work in rural areas of that particular district. And that, this has supported the policy of establishing medical schools in rural areas. Uh, so how to focus on rural health force? Uh, these are the motivation. Last year I talked about this in details. So I'm not going into the details of this particular concept. See, to motivate medical students to work in rural areas, you require five important factors. You require health facility related factors. You require personal and lifestyle factors which needs to be addressed. You require proper medical training. You have to take care of the curricular factors. And you have also to see about the medical school related factors and policy factors. So what are the basically motivators which will guide the students to continue to practice in rural area? The first is a rural background. So if a student is brought, being brought up in a rural area, he is most likely to serve in the rural area. Training in rural area with a community-based curriculum. This is important. The present curriculum does not address to these issues. And this is one of the drawbacks of Indian medical education system that they address to areas only related to urban areas. Early exposure to the community during medical training and rural location of the medical college. The demotivators are is perceived lack of infrastructure. So students in general have a perception that the rural infrastructure is going to be bad and if they go to rural areas, they may not be able to serve the uh, people. There's a high workload, which is true because there is lack of, lack of infrastructure, lack of manpower, so they will have to face this particular problem. Poor hospital management because of uh, many issues which are related to government. Isolation because as an individual, as a medical graduate, you will be alone in that particular community. Uh, possible problems in dealing with and providing healthcare. These are the problems which have been discussed in literature and we also know that if you go to rural area, it is not going to be that easy. The problem of return of investment on the high tuition fee paid. So you, if you have paid a, a fees in crores, you don't expect to earn in crores in the rural area. And there is an expectation about minimum monthly salary which is not fulfilled by the government. Uh, regarding my institution, sir talked about public-private partnership. My institution was the first uh, institution where this public-private partnership was uh, undertaken. Uh, this was, institute was established uh, in the Gandhi Bus Centenary year in 1969. It was the first rural medical college of India. Uh, we received 50% grants from government of India. 25% from go government of Maharashtra and 25% from our own society, which is basically from running of the hospital. So we don't, uh, it is no profit basis. The fees which we offer are same as of all government medical colleges in Maharashtra. Uh, initially, we had Gandhian Thoughts as one of the paper for MBBS interns, but after NEET, that has been discontinued. We have 50% students from all India, 50% uh, students from Maharashtra, and earlier we had reservation for rural candidates. That, that has been also uh, discontinued because NEET uh, does not allow special reservation for rural candidates. We had three unique programs to have been already adopted by NMC. Uh, we used to have an orientation camp of all our students who were newly admitted in the Gandhi Ashram. They used to stay there for 15 days. Uh, that has been accept accepted by NMC as an induction program. But for us, they have allowed us to continue this orientation program in Gandhi Ashram. The second was social service camp at Adopted Village, where our students stay in the village for 15 days, and they continue to be associated that, with that village for next uh, three years. This has been also taken up by NMC on a large scale. 
all medical colleges have been told to adopt a village and students are supposed to be associated that, with that village. Uh, the third program which we are running is on the final part one, that is a rural oriented medical education. They are posted, the students stay in the uh, rural training health center where they are trained about public health as aspect and we focus that they do research on different public health uh, aspects. And this is a unique program where we, our students learn about uh, what are the problems which are faced in the public health system and how to do research on those uh, even before they graduate as MBBS candidates. Uh, we had a compulsory 2 years rural service at designated rural hospital run by NGOs. So we used to post our students in, uh, with NGOs, not with any government agency. And Satasai Hospital was one of the hospital where we used to uh, send our students. But this program has also been discontinued because of need. Need does not uh, give any importance to people who serve in rural areas. So this is what uh, I just, said, just was reading an alumni blog. Uh, this was a girl uh, who came basically from Bombay. Now she, she is settled in Hubli. So in her blog, she uh, was recounting her experiences about our institute. So she wrote that in Mumbai, my friends pursuing other fields were putting up pictures of their partying, wearing latest trends, enjoying in cantings and bunking lectures. And here I was wearing a khadi apron, posted in a village, staying in makeshift tents with a pits as toilets. I was surrounded by goats, cows, and buffaloes. I was moving around in a village, telling importance of building com compost, importance of constructing toilets, serving kids with deficiencies, anemia, and worm infestation, antenatal and genetics for hypertension and cataract. A city girl who never left her house was now amongst gross, grassroots. Did any of us regret or felt disappointed? Never. So even if you post them in rural areas, they will still be happy about that. But we have to first post them there. And this is one of the student-led uh, initiative. I talked about values, how the students can on their own change the values. Uh, for last two, three years, some of our students uh, are involved in this initiative and they on their own, without any uh, promises from our side, they have gone to the villages and they are after doing their MBBS and they are still serving in that areas. So this is a very important change which we have observed. So without any uh, promise of post-graduation, without any promise of getting super specialities, on their own they have gone to the village. So these were the students group for social initiatives, uh, what, what they themselves called as white coat army. They, 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 this had an opportunity to understand social factors for ill health, like addiction, and engage actively in organizing and managing health talks in hospital as well as community setting. And they used to have a Sunday meetings, uh, which was an informal space for discussion, heartful emotions, and joy where values like equality, justice, and socio-economic political perspectives of ill health were discussed in a healthy and interactive manner. So these are the photographs. Uh, the girls is giving talk on the, uh, of the White Coat Army. And these uh, students were sitting in the corridor of the college, and they used to study, they used to discuss about different things in the life. Uh, this was uh, basically the students were, who were involved in an initiative by such Gadchiroli. You probably have heard about Dr. Abhay Bang. So this initiative is known as Nirman. So our students got involved with this initiative, and these were the students who on their own went to the rural areas. So what are the solutions which we have to, we have to offer? It should be a rural medical uh, institution with independence to get right students. Right students, what I mean is local students. There should be a focus curriculum development and methodology. So the students should be exposed to NGOs which are working in rural areas during their electives. NMC has started two months elective programs and during these electives they should be posted in rural areas rather than working in a medical college. 
government has to offer financial assistance to institution and students so it, they can be provided low cost edu education we must understand that the fees in a government medical college is still so high that it is not easy for a uh, middle class person to get his daughter or son educated in medical curriculum the still uh, fees in a government medical college is also in lakhs it is not in thousands so when we talk about low cost education we basically were talking about giving education to the students in thousand rupees not lakhs of rupees so the uh, basic aim is to reduce cost of medical education so students from the poorest population can afford it uh, and i must thank uh, satya sai trust uh, uh, swami ji because he has given 50 lakh rupees annually to my institution so i, I can provide uh, education to poor students i can give them scholarship and i have been always uh, grateful to him because he came here last year and he promised uh, in his own speech so last year he has already donated 50 lakhs we have not been able to spend <laughs> because the student admission got delayed because of uh, covid crisis but we will be using this fund uh, which was gravitated by the swamiji and institution may be allowed to develop their own pattern of providing rural health services which may be adopted later at a wider scale this is important that all health sector, sector institutions educational institutions must be socially accountable they should not be only involved in health sector they should be also involved in taking uh, care of all social aspects of the community where they work thank you Sainam, uh, thanks to all the speakers for being precise and up to the theme of the session of affordability of medical education. Because of lack of time, we'll not take the questions at present. We'll try to take, if time, time permits, we'll take all the questions at the end of today's session. Uh, I'll try to summarize the whole session, today's session, the first session. Our first speaker was Dr. Satish Babu. He explained the health economics and health demography of India with a special emphasis on rural health crisis. He also explained the necessity of a reorganization of medical education strategies to address new challenges of soaring tuition costs, ambiguity in college framework, growing medical seats, improving of education system, facilitating the gap between the rural and urban medical colleges, and making the process of opening the health institutions easier, especially in rural areas for un, uh, underserved population. Our second speaker was Dr. Sachidanan. Dr. Sachidanan elucidated in simple words the concept of public-private partnership or PPP or triple P, its advantages and disadvantages, and how it is useful in overcoming, overcoming the challenges in providing the med medical education, especially in rural areas. He also explained the Niti Aayog model of linking the new and existing medical colleges to be linked with the district hospital. Shortcomings of triple P, PPP, were also duly discussed as it neither addresses the shortage of doctors and health professionals, nor the unequal distribution of health professionals in urban and rural areas. He also explained about the new relaxations of NMC to open the new health institutions, in, especially in the rural areas. Our last speaker was Dr. Nitin Gangani. Dr. Gangani very well accentuated on the importance of rural health workforce and pointed out the motivators and demotivators for medical students to practice in rural areas. He also suggested the solution for the problem by giving authorization for rural institutions to select right students from local area with focused curriculum and methodology and providing financial assistance to institution and students for low cost but socially accountable quality medical education. With these words, I conclude 
today's first session. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. May we request Dr. Rakupati to please hand over a token of our love and appreciation to Dr. Sachidanan. And Dr. Bali, to please present a token of our love to Dr. Nitin Ganganey. <clears throat> we thank the session chairs and the speakers, and we request for a group photo, please. With that, we come to the close.